let's take a critical look about uh, the cultural stigma. Now, because of the cultural stigma, some victims are unable to come out to re report the cases. Of course, we know that some of them, it's they are people that are very dear to them, people that they look at role models, their fathers, their uncles, and their guidance that are the perpetrators. We also have situations where some of these cases are never documented because of cultural stigma. So what has been done by FIDA and other NGOs and the UN to make sure that courage has been given to these victims to come out and report the cases for possible prosecution of uh, victims? Okay. Um, I'm glad you mentioned cultural stigmatization. It has been a huge fight. It's been one of the um, headed dragon that confronts us when the issues of sexual gender-based violence is being discussed. Because on one hand, you have a victim or a survivor, so to say. And then you have, on the other hand, that person is afraid of being stigmatized. Oh, she's a rape victim. She was raped. She was gang raped and all of that. So you find that person struggling whether to come up and come out and speak about her experiences. I'm deliberately using her because we understand that even though the men, the boys are involved, their percentage, it's very, very negligible. And, if, you know, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's very little. It's very negligible. And for every one rape case or a sexual gender-based violence case that is reported, there are like, you have like 10 or 20 of them that have not been reported. And truly, like you said, that is because of fear of stigmatization. Now, what have we done at FIDA? Because you mentioned what are we doing at FIDA. At FIDA, we have been increasing our advocacy, the level of awareness. Because one of the fears people have is, even if I speak up, Nothing will be done to this person. This person will still be walking free on the streets. So why do I bring myself to such a ridicule? Why do I have to talk about it when this person will still go unpunished? But what we have been doing at FIDA across the 36 states of the Federation, including FCT, is trying to increase the awareness that victims or survivors can actually get justice. But of course, you cannot get justice if you don't speak up. You need to have the strength, you need to have the courage to be able to come out and speak up. And you're speaking up, you're not just speaking up for yourself. You're speaking up for another person who probably is lying in wait to become a victim. Because when you speak up and the matter is being taken up by the necessary authority, perhaps, I know that, I do know that if we get more convictions, this crime will be deterred. You know, a lot of people will, people will be deterred. There will be, um, people will not feel so free to continue to commit and perpetuate this crime. Like I said before, you don't repent from a crime. You repent from sin. And because this is a crime not just against an individual, it is a crime against a state, people should be, men, men, people should be accountable for it. Whether you repent or not is immaterial, so long as the law is consigned. So on, on the issue of um, stigmatization and all of that, we encourage people to speak up. And I can assure you, I can tell you that increasingly, people are beginning to find the courage to speak up where there is victimization because they are beginning to have confidence in the fact that, oh, sometimes people don't even, people are not even aware that there are laws that can be used to bring people to book. So people are beginning, because of our campaign, our advocacy, we go to everywhere, we go to villages, like in Abuja, we have gone to Abaji, Kwali, rural areas, Kuje, everywhere, sensitizing everybody that our first option is that we pray that these things don't happen. But the events that they happen, these are the remedies you have. But these remedies, you cannot assess them if you don't speak up. So the key to ending cultural stigmatization is speaking up. People should learn to speak up. You don't speak up, you die in silence. So why don't you speak up so that these perpetrators can be brought to book? All right, so, um, so I'm much, just going to ask Adua we before we wrap up. In the next Thank you, because of seconds, time, I appreciate it. Uh, I moved the button to my colleague Anne the Donna crime being yeah, committed. And Abu. here's the thing. Regardless of how much we try to rehabilitate people, 
who perhaps were even conscripted into militia groups and forced to, you know, perpetrate some of these crimes. What is the best method out of this to ensure that even victims get some sort of justice? In the next 30 seconds, how, could, how would you react to this? I think we have the biggest speaker importance of the maintain of the law, of being able to have the capacity to not only for we are encouraging people to come forward, but we also should have systems in place that when they come forward, they come forward and that they will get just if they do come forward because community. But um from I think what a key a key component is having robust laws in place, and when there are laws in place, making sure that all the different actors who are involved are fully informed on that, and also to really make it an issue about the perpetrators that it's not and it's not a shame on the victims actually, but a shame really where it right lies is is with the perpetrators for committing such acts and who are often non-combatants in some of these conflicts. All right, I think uh, the connection is poor. Uh, then let me just come back to the studio here. Um, Rekia. Can I add to that? Uh, yeah, please, go ahead. Okay. Now, like in, 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 um, in our own climb here, in Nigeria here, what the law has been able to do for us is that, you know, when there's um, this sexual violence, when it occurs, you know, you're not only, it's not only a crime, you're not only traumatized. First and foremost, the victim or the survivor, sometimes we'll call them victim, other times we'll call them survivor. Yeah. But maybe for the purpose of this discussion, we can just say survivor. The survivor now, according to the law, in accordance with the law, is entitled to medical care. That's, I'm talking about the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, yeah. 2015. So the survivor is entitled to medical care. The survivor is also entitled to psychosocial support. You know, because it traumatizes, the, the, the survivor is, is traumatized. So the survivor needs some form of counseling to be able to get out of the trauma. Sometimes it's lifelong. Lifelong in the sense that, for instance, if a child is involved, yeah. you know, you, every time you see the child, you're not happy. So the survivor goes through counseling, goes through that psychosocial support so that gradually she is integrated back into the society. And where the case eventually goes to court, where it is prosecuted, the law is such that, you know, the person can be compensated. It's not just a normal, regular criminal justice system where, oh, because it is a crime against the state, the state's, you know, uh, conviction is secured and the person just goes to prison. No, this time around, the survivor can be compensated. Of course, in monetary terms, it cannot assuage everything, but you get some form of comfort that the person is not just walking on the streets free, having inflicted so much injury on you.